Okay, so now we want to discuss the gospel and new life, specifically Christian identity and calling. Um, I do want to give a shout out to one of my uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Jason Lee, especially when it comes to helping me understand the idea of Christian calling. He, he's been really, really helpful uh, to me. So actually, one of the slides I'm going to show is is from Dr. Lee. Here are our class goals for today. Uh, articulate a biblical understanding of Christian identity. I want you to know who you are in Christ. I want you to articulate a biblical understanding of Christian calling. I want you to be able to say, this is what I'm called to do. And know some key biblical texts that describe Christian identity and calling. Okay? So, I want you to be able to articulate a couple things and know some biblical texts. We think about calling, uh, people use calling in a number of different ways. Uh, sometimes you know, people talk about decisions that they have to make and they say, I didn't feel God was calling me to that. So it's decision-making calling. Sometimes you hear people give a testimony of faith and you say, God called me out of a life of sin. And by that they mean a call to salvation. Sometimes... Even at the beginning of this class, someone asked me, what made you feel the call to ministry? Like, how did you feel a call to ministry? So we're using calling in a variety of ways. And at the end of the class today, I want you to know what is the calling of every Christian. And then in light of that, I want you to be able to understand your vocational calling as well. So... You all, I've asked many of you what your intended major will be. And, and most of you, have, you just have a variety of, of callings, so vocational aspirations. And I want to say that all of those are important and valuable. But regardless, we all share at least one central Christian calling. Okay, So we'll understand uh, our, our vocations in light of our Christian calling. But I want to start with this idea of identity. And in order to understand what our identity is, we need to recall some of the key concepts that we discussed when we talked about the gospel. So we talked about the gospel being about salvation. So if the gospel is about salvation. We've responded to the gospel by faith and repentance. Part of our identity now is saved. We're saved. Uh, we are reconciled, we are redeemed, we are restored, we are justified. Now, what I want you to see in each of those ideas, it is, it is God who acts. So it's God who acts to save, God who acts to reconcile, God who acts to redeem. And then we can describe ourselves as being redeemed. That means that for the Christian, part of our identity is really wrapped up in another. Our identity is defined by what God has done. Now, even that concept runs pretty countercultural to what is kind of infused into our cultural DNA. Your identity is about God and what He has done, what he, how He has acted, what He has declared. That God has declared you reconciled, or God has declared you adopted, defines who you are. And this really is drawing on a, a really big biblical theological theme. Uh, you, you think about even early in Genesis. I was reading this in my devotions uh, this morning. You, you have these people, uh, they gathered together at Babel, and they're going to build this big tower and why are they going to build it? Remember? Yeah. Or they want to be like God. And they say, we want to make a name for ourselves. And what happens? They're dispersed. In the very next chapter, God chooses somebody. Who does He choose? Remember? Abraham, right? And He says, He goes to Abram. And he chooses him and says, I am going to make you a great nation. So you see the difference between people saying, I'm going to define myself by what I've done versus God choosing and making somebody, defining that identity. We see it even when we get into 
First uh, uh, and Second Samuel. Uh, we, we think about the distinction between somebody like Saul. When everybody looks at him and says, Oh, Saul, look how tall he is. Like, that's, that's our king. Versus David, who is a man after God's own heart. These contrasts are contrasts of identity. You know, I really saw the need to reinforce this uh, when I started having kids, right? You want kids to understand who they are. They need to have a, a clear understanding of their identity in Christ. And also, like, I want them to have a family identity, right? So sometimes we'll say in my household, we don't do that in our family, do we? And whatever that wrong action is, there's a sense of family identity that we have. This was <laughs> this became really apparent to me the uh, a couple weeks ago where my baby girl, she's four, uh, she comes running up to me crying and like when my baby girl cries, like my heart just melts. I want to know like who made her cry. Um, in this case, uh, we were at we were at a soccer game, and the person that made my baby girl cry was my my other baby girl, uh, my, my middle daughter. And I said, Amaya, what's wrong? And she says, They told me I'm a rotten egg. And I was like, Okay, so apparently there's a game you play, and somebody gets declared to be the rotten egg. But for Amaya, in her little four-year-old mind, uh, she was three at this time even, she was like, this is a crisis of identity. She's like, this is not who I am. I do not want to be the rotten egg. So as a parent, what do I do? I look her in the eyes and I say, Amaya, you have to know who you are. And you go back to them and you say, I'm not a rotten egg. I'm Amaya Hope Rogers. And she's like, she looks at me, she's like, I don't want to say no, baby girl, you got to go. Because I have to have her understand what her identity is and to assert that identity in the face of opposition. Now, I might be overplaying that episode. I get that. Uh, but she said, I don't want to go. I said, I'll go with you. Because I want my kids to be able to say in the face of questions about who they are, this is who I am. I am a Maya Hope Rogers. I'm not a rotten egg. And on a more serious note, I want all of you to know who you are in Christ. I want each of you to be able to say, this is my identity. Whatever the world might say about me, whatever I might be tempted to believe that's wrong, whatever the evil one might want to tempt me to think about myself, I want you to know who you are in Christ. And when you know who you are in Christ, not on account of what you have done, but on account of what Christ has done, then you have confidence and security in your daily walk. Identity in Christ and knowing that reality is crucial for the Christian life. Dr. White sometimes says, hey, we were going through a chapel series and he used to say this phrase and I thought it was really helpful. And he would keep saying, there are a number of things that describe us, but those things don't define us. So we might have a student here and we might say, this student is tall or this student is athletic or this student is musically gifted or or uh, this student is, is, is funny, or whatever those things might be, those are descriptions. But fundamentally what defines that student as a Christian is that he is in Christ. So there are a number of things that might describe us, and those things, they might be fine descriptions. But you want to take care on what defines you. So we joked earlier about the CrossFitter. Um, you know, you know somebody is into CrossFit, right? Because does anybody know? Does anybody here know somebody who's into CrossFit? Yeah. Okay. So, um, if I met that friend of yours that's into CrossFit, I would be able to spot them immediately, right? Because they're going to have their gallon water jug. They're going to be talking about their workout of the day. They're going to have a rogue T-shirt on. You know, they just like embody that identity. And I want to say, like, as a Christian, like those things can describe you, but what needs to define you? is who you are in Christ. Okay, key text. Ephesians chapter 1. Now, we looked at this text when we looked at what is the gospel. Now, we, we drew out some elements of 
how this describes the gospel, I want to point out another textual feature that Paul is emphasizing here. So, the textual feature is this in Christ or in Him reality. I want to read this and I want you to see how pervasive this concept is in Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ. In Christ. So what does that concept mean? With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place and even as He chose us in Him, that is in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ. So we have this in Christ, the identity in Christ, and we have this concept of ad- adoption as well. According to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the beloved, that is, in Christ again, in Him, in Christ We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. So it is in Christ we have redemption. We have forgiveness. So all of these concepts are connected to being in Christ according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Christ, in Him. So this this cosmic reconciliation is in Christ. Things in heaven and things on earth. What, What else can we say with this being in Christ? In Him, that is in Christ, we have an inheritance. Having been predestined. So inheritance, that's the end of the Christian life. Predestination, beginning of the Christian life. All of that in Christ according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope... Oh, I missed one. See what I missed? We'll correct that. In Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him. So we hoped in Him. Now, in Him, you also, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him... You were sealed with a promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Okay, so you see this textual feature that is repeated in Ephesians 1 that now you are in Christ. So the term, the theological term we use for this, you should write this down, is called union with Christ. Union with Christ. So what does it mean as a, to be a Christian now is that we have union with Christ. And this, this concept of being in Christ or having union with Christ is an overarching concept through which we can understand all of these other things. And we can understand all of the redemption, the forgiveness, the adoption language. We can understand predestination language. All of this through this concept the overarching concept of union with Christ. What is union with Christ? So one uh, one New Testament scholar, Richard Gaffin, says this. Uh, the, re- the expression of union with Christ refers to the believer's solidarity or association with Christ by the Holy Spirit through faith by virtue of which believers partake of His saving benefits. So to be in Christ, to be united to Christ, uh, means that we have an association or identity in Christ. Okay, So overarching concept of Christian identity is union with Christ. Well, what flows out of that union with Christ? The idea of new creation. So part of the Christian identity is new creation. Someone mentioned this earlier when we were talking about gospel text. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is what? In Christ. So if anyone has association with, has union with Christ, he is what? A new creation. 
The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to Himself. So reconciliation is part of this union with Christ. That is Christ... Uh, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself. So again, that union with Christ language. Okay, so what do you see here? You see, in Christ, union with Christ involves new creation. So this is really important. You need to understand that as a Christian, you are radically new. So uh, at the time in which you repent of sins, trust in Christ, we sometimes call that conversion, Another term for that is is new creation. You pass from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You pass from being a a child under the wrath of God to being an adopted child of God. You are a radically new creation. Another concept that's so important is that of adoption. We've seen this in a couple of texts already. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. So He sent His Son to assume human nature, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave. You see, you used to be a slave. But now you're a son, and if a son, then you're an heir. Because you're adopted. What an encouraging reality that is to be adopted. It means you have all the rights and privileges of a son. You have an inheritance that defines who you are, your identity. Also, in union with Christ, you need to understand you're adopted, you're a new creation. You are forgiven. There's a short text in Colossians 1. Colossians 1 is this kind of, uh, some people call it a hymn about Christ, about what He has done. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. That's a powerful truth. You know, sometimes uh, I encounter young believers, or old believers for that matter, who have a really hard time believing that they actually are forgiven. That they're actually new creation. God has forgiven every sin in Christ. At some point, you might be tempted to doubt that, but my challenge to you in that is don't minimize the cross of Christ by magnifying your sin. Don't say that your sin is so great that the cross of Christ could never forgive that. In Christ, Scripture says, you're forgiven. You also need to know you're forgiven and you're loved. Now, I want to deal with a slightly longer text here because it's hard for some of us to believe that God actually loves us. Whatever our circumstances are that have made us doubt our our worth, uh, we need to hear from God's Word that He loves us. There's now no for, therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's how chapter 8 begins. And here's how chapter 8 of Romans ends. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So it's a confident declaration to say, look, life's going to be hard. There's going to be things that are going to tempt you to believe that God might not be for you. You're going to face hard circumstances. Christian life is not going to be easy. If God's for us, who can be against us? How did God demonstrate that He is for us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? God has already demonstrated that He will give you good things. 
He gave you the greatest gift in His Son. So you're like, oh, but am I really forgiven? Am I really loved? And Paul says, who can bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. How can someone bring a charge before God saying this person is guilty when it's already God who has sent His Son and has justified you through the work of His Son? Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? We call this His session. And through His session, He makes intercession. Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, in all these things, in all of these hardships that you will experience in the Christian life, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Listen to this promise. I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation. Okay. He covered everything, height, depth, everything, powers, anything else, something that's uh, present or future, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of, in Christ, of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I so want Cedarville students to understand that God loves you. There's going to be hardships in life. There's going to be times when you're tempted to doubt this. There's going to be moments of despair. There might be moments of despondency. There are going to be moments of discouragement. There might be seasons of that. There might be seasons when it just feels like the darkness doesn't lift. Please, when you feel that despair, go to Romans 8. Be reminded that your identity is a beloved child of God. It doesn't matter what anyone else says about you. It doesn't matter what the world would say about you. It doesn't matter what a friend would say about you. Even there might be a family member who make, might make you feel totally unloved. You need to hear that God loves you. God loves you in such a way that He sent His Son to die for you. There is nothing in all creation that can separate you from the love of God. Some of you have heard that a hundred times. And for some of you, you're like, I believe that. Some of you are still struggling to believe that. I know that that's probably true in this room. Some of you are struggling to believe that God really does love you. And I want to challenge you, believe the truth of His Word. For most of you, at some point in your life, it's going to be a struggle to believe that you are loved. You're going to look at yourself and you're going to say, I'm unlovable. And I want you to hear from Romans 8 that there is nothing that will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Please believe that truth. Another thing you need to know about yourself is that you're freed from sin. You're freed from sin. So you're loved and you're freed from sin. And when I talk with college students, sometimes they just feel like this, <laughs> if they're going to doubt something in Romans, this is one of those things like, I don't feel free from sin. I feel like there are sins to which I am in bondage, they'll say. They'll say something like, I know that my words are not God-honoring, but I feel like I'm in bondage to uh, unwise and ungodly patterns of speech. Or uh, they might say that they're caught up in some pervasive sin in their life and they don't feel like they're really free from sin. And I want to challenge you to believe the truth of the gospel that you are a new creation in Christ and you are freed from the power of sin. For if we have been united with Him, so what is 
remember, union with Christ. If we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So you realize part of your old life, the, when you're in the kingdom of darkness, when you're enslaved to sin, when you're a child of wrath, is mean you, you, you were powerless, like you were enslaved to sin, but you've been freed from sin through the work of Christ. So that we would no longer be enslaved to it, verse 7, for the one who has died has been set free from sin. That means if you have been united to the death of Christ, you have been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. The death that He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life that He lives, He lives to God. So now you're oriented to living towards God. What does this mean? You consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Part of your Christian identity, being united with Christ, being forgiven, being loved, being adopted, also means as a new creation, you have a, a new life that's not enslaved to sin. So while in your former life, you would say in Adam, you had an inability to obey, you had an inclination to rebel. You even had inherited guilt. Now in Christ, you have an ability to obey. You have an ability to follow God. You have a freedom from that former way of living. All of those things are true of you in Christ. So it's not sufficient for a Christian just to say like, Oh, wow, well, you know, I, I, this, this sin just has, me, has a hold on me or I'm enslaved to it. I'm not saying that you won't sin, but I'm saying that part of your identity in Christ is to be freed from the power and bondage of sin. But what you need to understand, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, is that the Christian life and being freed from sin is also indwelt by the Spirit uh, by which you have the ability to obey. Okay, so it's not that you are, le it's not like you're, you're, you're saved by grace and now you've heard the term saved by grace, sanctified by sweat. No, it's that the Spirit is at work in you. Okay, and we'll develop that a little bit more as well. Okay, one more text about Christian uh, union with Christ. Union with Christ also entails calling or commissioning. So this is part of the text that we are memorizing for this class. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not your own doing, it's the gift of God. So remember, I'm emphasizing identity. The Christian identity is about what God has done. Not a result of works. Not about what you've done. So that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So... In our new creation identity, you know, we looked at that with union with Christ, there is a call to good works that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So the Christian united with Christ has all of those things that are true of him or her. And that also entails that we are called or commissioned for a particular walk of life, a particular good works. And we want to describe what is that calling that flows from our union with Christ. So what is the calling of a Christian? Now, I'm going to start with this idea of, of primary calling. So I told you we, we use calling in, in a variety of ways. I want to talk about two to start out. One way we talk about calling is the gospel call. So we might say that's the call to be a Christian. So 2 Thessalonians is one way to talk about calling here. It's the gospel call. 
We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in truth. To this He called you. So He called you to be saved, to be sanctified. So this is the call of salvation. He did this call through the gospel. So we can call this the gospel call or the call of salvation. So that you might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So one way to describe call is you are called by the gospel to believe, right? So to be called is to be a Christian. But that Christian identity, that gospel call, entails a call to orient your life in a way that glorifies God. And Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 10. There's several other passages you could look at here. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So what is the primary call of the Christian? The primary call of the Christian is to glorify God in whatever you do. Does anybody uh, in their family do catechism? We do this. You guys know what catechism is? Um, so catechism is like a, a set of questions and memorized responses. So uh, in our family, we've got, we've got a catechism. We do this every night in, de, in family devotions. So I'm going to ask a question and we'll see if any of you did this particular catechism. What is the chief end of man? Anybody got that? What's chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Yeah, so that's, you know, that's one response uh, of what is the chief end or what is the call of mankind. It's to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And here are some of the verses that point to that end. So how do we think about calling as a Christian? Okay. What is the primary calling? Well, I'm going to say that the primary calling is to glorify God. But calling, when we think about calling, is a call to live with the end in view. Okay? And Dr. Lee has helped me, helped me think through this stuff. So calling, we say a call to glorify God is living with the end in view. Glorifying God is the end of every Christian. So... What are you going to do for all eternity? You're going to glorify God, right? That's your call. That's what creation is oriented to do. But we think about the Christian life. Think about the beginning of the Christian life is responding to the gospel call. And the gospel call is the call to live with the end in view, right? And how do we live out this Christian life? Well, we do it through the Bible. The God who knows speaks and thereby reveals His person and work. So calling, this calling here, is an appeal to live with the end in view. And the Bible, we have right there, provides wisdom for the Christian between the beginning and end of the Christian life. Now, most of this course is going to deal with this section right in here. Like, how do we interact with the Bible? Uh, but what we want you to understand is uh, this is a way, this we're walking out in text-oriented spiritual disciplines, interpreting the Word rightly, is a way to live out and is the way to live out your calling of glorifying God with your whole life. So... If my primary calling is to glorify God in all things for all time, what is my, my secondary calling? Well, it's sometimes called our vocation. So Latin, anybody do Latin? Yeah, some of you guys did Latin. Uh, vocara means to call. So it's to pursue God's glory with our specific gifts, talents, and abilities. So God has gifted each of us in a particular way, and we are called to pursue God's glory in those ways. Now, third 
area we could talk about is that of occupation. So our occupation could be different than our secondary calling, like Paul. So Paul's primary calling is to glorify God in all things. His secondary calling is to use his apostolic gifts to establish the church, but his occupation couldn't match that in every way. He served as a tent maker. But our occupation should still be a way to live out our primary calling. So, where we're situated, we have a a lot of opportunity to kind of self-determine, if you will, that's not the best term, our occupation. Like we have some choice that we can make. You need to realize that that's pretty unique. Like most uh, 18-year-olds aren't sitting around thinking, I wonder what I'm going to be when I grow up. You know, around the world and throughout the history of the world, there there hasn't been a lot of uh, decision that an 18-year-old can make to this end. That was in some ways chosen or determined for you. You guys have a remarkable gift uh, to have some choice in your occupation. But regardless if you have choice here or not, you have a primary and a secondary calling to use the gifts that God has given you for His glory. Let's ask some questions now. So we know our primary calling. That's universal. Primary calling is a Christian to glorify God. Our secondary calling is to use the gifts that God's given us to uh, His glory. So we have different gifts. So there is some more, uh, some, some that's more individual about that. Now we have this question about occupation. And this is something that we, we talk a lot at Cedarville because we value all of the majors at Cedarville. So you know I teach in the School of Biblical and Theological Studies. But I don't want you to think by that that the only major that I value is biblical studies. I want to say that all of those majors are really important. Like, I love that we have Christian nurses, that we have Christian pharmacists and engineers and teachers and social workers and all the different majors that we do at Cedarville. I believe in all of them. I value them. But I do want to challenge students to think, why are you doing that? So, I don't want to pick on any one major, but I'm going to choose one. Um, Okay, so I talked with a young man once, and I said, okay, so what's your major? And he said, electrical engineering. He said, great. I know a lot of electrical engineers that use the, the gifts and abilities God has given them for His glory, and they're totally oriented towards the advancement of the gospel and God's glory in it. But I asked him, I said, like, okay, well, why do you want to be an electrical engineer? He's like, I, I really thought I could make a lot of money doing it. Okay. Now, I don't have an issue with being an electrical engineer. But is that the best motivation? Well, I thought, well, maybe. Maybe he's thinking, like, look, i got a lot of friends going on the mission field. I want to, I want to just give all my money to them and support that. So why? He's like, man, I've always wanted a boat and I've always wanted a few extra houses. <laughs> like, you know, one of the things I love about college students is they'll just say things, you know, like they won't, they don't filter it. So you're like, I probably shouldn't say this. He just, he just went with it. I want a boat and some extra houses. And I said, do you think that is going to be the most God glorifying approach to your life? He said, well, I never thought about it like that. <laughs> It's like, okay, well, maybe we should start. (laughs) Uh, And so the question is, why do we endeavor in certain occupations? Here are a couple of questions. First one, can this job be done to the glory of God? Okay, so like, is it inherently non-Christian, right? So I'm not going to name a bunch of professions, but, you know, like there are non there are there are professions, there are uh, jobs that are inherently non-Christian. They're like, you can't do these if you're going to be a Christian, okay? So, is it inherently non-Christian? If it is, don't do it. 
And then you ask the question, well, what are my motivations? So let's take the engineer, for example. Well, no, electrical engineering is not an, a non-Christian uh, endeavor. It could be a, a really good thing. But what is it, what is the motivation for pursuing this job or career? Does it flow from worship or idolatry? And in that young man's life, it flowed from an idolatry, uh, materialism. Now, I want you to hear me here. I, I chose electrical engineering. I'm thinking of an electrical engineer, graduated not long ago. Um, and I'm telling you, this electrical engineer, this young man, he's brilliant. He, he's got an electrical engineering job. He's, I'm sure he's going to build a lot of great things. He's going to make a lot of money, and he's going to do it all for the glory of God. He's already, as a 23-year-old, leveraging his position and leveraging his finances for God's glory. And I really think his motivation for, for serving as an electrical engineer is, he said, God gave me the ability to do that. And he is uniquely brilliant. But he's doing it from truly Christian motivations. He's not saying, hmm, I've got this opportunity. How can I serve myself? He's like, how can I invest in things that eternally matter? And I want you to think about that in your career fields. Like you've, you've all shared with me, or many of you have shared with me what your major might be. But I want you to ask why. Why are you going to major in that? Is it because you are going to glorify God through that and that's your motivation? And I want to say... All the majors at Cedarville, you can glorify God through them. Like, I believe in every major that we have. But ask yourself why you are doing that. Here's a good quote. A Christian and a non-Christian may labor side by side in the same job. And on the surface, they're doing exactly the same thing. But work that is done in faith has a different significance than work that is done in unbelief, the doctrine of vocation, that is calling, helps the Christian see ordinary labors of life to be charged with meaning. It also helps to put their work into perspective, seeing that their work is not saving them, right? They have an identity in Christ about what God has done. But they are resting in the grace of God who in turn works through their labors to love and serve their neighbors. You know, it can really be a Godward motivation to, to build something, to be that engineer and to build something out of love for a neighbor. That could be a truly God-glorifying motivation. I'm going to give you a couple uh, works. I know some of you are thinking about these concepts and thinking about like, okay, what does this look like in my life? Here's a couple helpful works that I... Just, I'm not endorsing everything in these books, but I'm, thinking, I'm saying these are some good books to help you think through vocation. This is really important for us as a Christian liberal arts institution to say that, look, every major here matters. And uh, through every major, you can have an occupation that can serve the glorification of God. But we also want you to have Godward motivations in choosing a major and pursuing a career field and, and working in that. We want you to labor for the glory of God in various vocations. Okay, and, and I believe that you guys can do that. But at the outset of your college careers, I want to ensure that you have the right motivations for what you're doing.